and welcome to our final session of the day. If you'd like to ask a question, you can do so through slido.com using the event code SHIP Hacking. I'd now like to hand over to our host for this session, Ian Bramson. Thank you very much and welcome everyone to the Stanley Gray Lecture Series. Those who have attended in the past, uh, welcome back. Those who are new, welcome. I wanted to give you first a little bit of background about the Stanley Gray Lecture Series. Um, the namesake, Stanley Gray, was a chief mechanical engineer at the Port of Directorate of Basra from, in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, when he passed in 1973, he left half of his estate to create the Stanley Gray Fund to promote the distinction, uh, to promote distinction in maritime engineering. Uh, these lectures here began in 2002 to promote marine science and technology. Today, we welcome Nigel Hearn. Uh, he is a cybersecurity specialist with Pentest Partners. Nigel specializes in cybersecurity and transportation and critical national infrastructure. Um, he has a broad range of experience in this field, working um, with cyber on drilling rigs, bulk carriers, cruise lines, private yachts, all different types of, of vessels. Uh, he has presented to the House of Lords Select Committee on Maritime Cybersecurity. He's also presented at the International Security Expo, International Association of Drilling Contractors, and the European Association of Airports and Seaport Police Conference. Today, we're talking about hacking ships bridges. Um, what we're going to explore, what Nigel's gonna to explore today is uh, the vulnerabilities and exposures of ship navigation systems. He's gonna talk about how flaws allow attackers to access both IT and OT systems. This presentation um, is going to walk you through how hackers could abuse systems and human errors to wreak havoc at sea. Please welcome Nigel Hearn. And good afternoon to everybody. Um, nice to uh, see uh, somebody today. So yeah, good afternoon. And um, my name is Nigel Hearn and thank you for the introduction, uh, Ian. Um, I'm a, a senior cybersecurity specialist and project manager with Pentest Partners. Um, I'm an electronics engineer by background and came back into the IT and security space in 1999. Uh, that's on one of the uh, vessels we'll be talking about this afternoon, uh, which I'll touch on a, a little bit later on. Um, so uh, that's a, a, a Moss Maritime CS55, so it's a deep water drilling rig, quite an interesting project that we did uh, last year. Uh, the question for the organisation was, would it be possible to compromise the vessel remotely um, and drive it off station whilst uh, compromising the blowout protector? Um, and there's uh, some very interesting research came out of that that we can talk about today. Um, fortunately, um, we couldn't compromise the blowout protector. The big red button was, would always work on those vessels. We had a pair of them warm stacks on the African coast. Uh, but we could pretty much uh, compromise the rest of the vessel and the rest of its fleet, so quite an interesting project. So for those of you that don't know who Pendes Partners are, let me tell you a little bit, a little bit about us. Um, <clears throat> we are a pure play um, security uh, testing organisation uh, with the largest independently owned penetration testing company in the UK. Uh, established um, almost exactly 10 years ago by eight individuals, we're a little over 100 people today. Uh, mainly in the UK and Europe, but also some in the US. Uh, we're very well known for <clears throat> a background historically in critical national infrastructure. Um, so we have a lot of experience with, uh, with water and production and, um, and gas and oil. Um, and that's taken us on a really interesting journey into hardware um, and the internet of things from a consumer perspective and also the industrial uh, uh, internet of things. Um, and uh, really taken in, us into maritime and automotive and aviation and some, some very interesting uh, projects. We're also extremely well known for red teaming. Um, we're one of a handful of organisations in the UK that's authorised by the Bank of England to do the very large test called Seabest uh, for the financial top 30. And then uh, a couple of years ago, three years ago, the Cabinet Office introduced the same standard for the major government departments. Uh, we also do a lot of testing around um, traditional testing, external infrastructure, 
internal and also mobile and web applications. I'll talk a little bit of some of the implications on that in some amount of time as we go through the presentation. Um, the image there of uh, some of my colleagues on the BBC was um, uh, Roy Kethlin Jones, who's the technical uh, uh, presenter for the BBC. You'll find us a lot on the BBC website uh, with comments and research. And uh, I'll touch on some of the implications of uh, this program, uh, which uh, touches on uh, the testing we're doing about APIs and how as people are moving to a lot more cloud-based services, um, how some of those risks come into your vessels and your infrastructure. Um, <clears throat> and from a, a Pentas partner's perspective, we hold all the badges and qualifications you could possibly imagine. I won't bore you with all of these, but um, and needless to say, we have uh, all the qualifications that uh, you would expect of our type of organisation. So I thought, first of all, I'd touch on some of the regulations and the certifications that are around for maritime and in the future. Um, some of you will be familiar with uh, Cyber Essentials introduced by the, the uh, National Cyber Security Centre a few years ago, uh, a very basic entry, um, and hopefully uh, most of you will be familiar with uh, the IMO regulations, uh, which come into force in, in January. And that's been driving a, a lot more maritime testing um, over the last a year or so. <clears throat> We also do a, a lot of testing around uh, NIST or the NIST framework, um, which has a slightly different uh, term in, in the US. Um, and uh, that is quite applicable to so a lot of our maritime customers are looking to, to implement around that framework. Um, and there's also a STAR assessment, which um, is something that some of our clients have asked us to do. STAR is a, is a cut down version effectively of CBEST and GBEST, um, uh, organized by Crest. And there are some other um, worldwide standards that are the same on slightly different names. Uh, so effectively, a, 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 um, a targeted red team are going through attack plans based on what threat actors would be doing to target your organisation. Um, and also, I've, I've included the, the logo down there from the CAA for sure, which is a, an audit and compliance regime that they've introduced recently. And we're one of only a handful of organisations that are uh, able to uh, to complete those audits. We would fully expect something to appear in maritime in the same space um, shortly, um, certainly for, for the UK and across Europe um, to complement the, uh, the IMO regulations. So maritime cybersecurity um, and safety um, this year and last. We've not been, actually been onto a vessel for about three months now. Um, we have our, our next vessel test um, in two weeks time. So please be, get out on the water again. Um, the sort of things that we've done recently are uh, the deep water ex exploration a rig. Uh, we've been on one of the world's largest shipping containers at the end of last year, um, a resupply vessel, um, a seabed survey vessel. And uh, we did a, a cruise ship on its uh, shakedown voyage, um, which was really quite interesting. And um, we're one of only a handful of organisations that have done testing both above and below deck four. So above, above deck four being effectively a, a floating hotel and below deck four being the, um, uh, the OT and operation systems. Um, and a lot of research and testing around bridge systems applications. And I'll touch on um, some of the cloud-based services um, that will have implications and also some of the hardware testing. I'm not gonna get terribly bits and bytes in this uh, presentation. If you have any technical questions, happy to answer those. Um, and I thought I'd really start with, with the password problem, which we, we're still seeing. Um, a lot of people have a view that the vessel is um, at sea and therefore it's entirely airspace and isolated. Um, as we know, this isn't true. One of the most common things we find are passwords all over a, a vessel. Um, uh, it hasn't really changed. Um, very weak passwords. The password policies with on the vessel are, are generally weak. We quite often when we have a fleet of vessels, if we discover the password for one system on one vessel, it's pretty work, easy to work out what it's going to be for the rest of the fleet. Um, so uh, um, very little evidence of password managers or uh, password reuse. A lot of this um, is a, a victim of revolving crews. Um, so you would expect some, uh, some need to share passwords uh, across uh, um, uh, the same individual um, role for different individuals as, as people, uh, but quite often just stuck on keyboards and machines. Um, and that actually is also we find when we're doing um, the testing on a vessel, it's, it's very, very frequent that we, we can find a document uh, within the crew system somewhere that is holding passwords and information about the systems uh, across that vessel, which makes life very easy for hacker. Um, it's very common in um, land-based systems and uh, even more so common as we get onto the water. Um, 
And default passwords are continuing a problem. Really interesting that um, we, we very frequently find systems that have the default passwords remaining from the system install. Um, these are some screenshots from a test that we did earlier uh, at the end of last year. Uh, so what you can see there is an IP telephone system, uh, a video system, and then the SATCOM uh, modem itself and the SATCOM controller, all of which had the default passwords um, installed on those systems, um, and they hadn't been changed from install, um, which is one of the reasons that uh, Ecclesiastes is important to audit. Um, again, making life very easy for, for a threat out of the case of the whole system. Um, this was a, a, another example of a SATCOM um, on a vessel, a vessel uh, deployed, and the username and password were the defaults for uh, that system. And this SATCOM was available with a publicly addressable IP address. So anybody could uh, uh, identify uh, the SATCOM. Um, I'll talk very briefly about how we can do that. Um, and then just SSH straight to it, uh, to either device uh, using the default credentials. Um, and a lot more common than perhaps uh, you would imagine. So how would we find vulnerable hardware as the first? So we're looking to attack a vessel. Um, phishing is one route, I'll touch on that in a moment. The other way is to identify what is visible. Um, some of you may be familiar, there's a, a search engine called Shodan. Um, Shodan is a, is a search engine that crawls the internet and looks for hardware that is visible on the public internet. Um, and it's amazing what you can find using Shodan. Um, uh, one of the things that we looked for was a Sailor 900. Uh, which at the time was a, uh, a SATCOM device that had a vulnerability, it's subsequently been patched. Um, and we noticed there were, there were 51 of them at the time that were visible on public IP addresses. So what we decided to do was map that across AIS data. Um, and we mapped a, a number of different solutions that were vulnerable at the time, uh, which are on the left there. Um, and we effectively created a map of real-time SATCOM that was on the, on the public internet that had a vulnerability that could potentially be exploited. Um, so that was a, quite a, an interesting, um, uh, an interesting uh, experiment. Um, some of the dots that you see that are, are land-based are either on canals or they're, um, in some cases, there'll be home users uh, that are using a, a home SATCOM system. Um, so, the initial thing we can do is identify what can we hack. Um, there's a, another way that um, again has been packed for a while. I'll, I'll show this one. He's looking at phishing. Um, quite an interesting exploit once upon a time with, with KVH with their Combox, um, where in a previous version, um, which if uh, some of these are owned and managed by KVH, all of which are running up to date services now, some of them are owned by end users and, and some of those are still not patched. This particular version allowed you to identify the users um, that were active and registered on that particular SATCOM modem. Um, so from that, we identified the gentleman on the little uh, screen at the bottom. Uh, we then found him on Facebook and identified him and the vessel he was on. So we would now have a target from a phishing attack um, to potentially look to, uh, to target, to try and get a foothold in the vessel. So at this point, we would have two potential routes to a vessel, one directly by the SATCOM, uh, if it's on the public internet and poorly configured, or potentially by a phishing attack. Um, both of these were used to compromise the, uh, the drilling route, which I'll touch on a bit later on. Um, one of the other things we look for when we go on a vessel is, is when's an air gap, not an air gap. Uh, people very frequently talk about the separation between uh, OT and IT, and it's very common uh, thought process that these are on completely different systems. Um, however, the, I've just run through some examples where this isn't true. Um, one of the first things we do when we're doing a vessel audit is we will um, go into the, uh, the comms rooms um, and we will identify the serial networks, which typically are running the OT. So RS-232 or 485 or Modbus, um, which are typically then converted into Ethernet and running over fiber. So what we typically do is then put a media converter um, in one of the lines and we'll tap it um, and start to start reading the, uh, the data that's going down those, uh, those fiber connections. What we quite, quite often uh, identify is um, HTTP traffic that shouldn't be there, um, and also identifying the, the serial data. Um, if we can see it, we can also modify it, which I'll touch on as well. So um, we'll, we'll look for unexpected traffic. Um, we'll look at uh, intercepting some of the serial traffic if we uh, know what it's connected to, and we can uh, change its uh, 
uh, modify it between the devices that are talking to each other and then also identify things that shouldn't be there. So some of the things that we, we often find, um, bridging an air gap, um, things like data historians or vessel data recorders, um, uh, PCs that have been dual home that may have two purposes and where we're told they are never connected to both networks at once, quite often we can demonstrate isn't true. Uh, we find unexpected devices on the serial network, perhaps where something's been connected incorrectly, um, unknown modems and then under undocumented systems. So I'll, I'll run through a few of these. So uh, these two are data historians. Um, classically, we'll find the HMI, the human machine interface, um, will be sitting on, the, on the, uh, the ship's operational network, whilst the data historian is taking information from uh, the operational network. Um, in many cases, this is the device that we use to bridge from IT to OT. Um, so these devices um, uh, mean that there is no air gap. Um, and it's quite common that these aren't protected. Um, uh, on, on various vessels that we've audited. The majority of them, uh, this gives us a route between the two networks. Um, this is an example on, on a vessel where um, we identified um, a server, um, in this case, a, 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 just a, a, in, a, in a, a room somewhere, um, and it had evidence that it had been connected to both networks in the past. Um, so we found uh, a socket plugged in the Ethernet cable, and lo and behold, it's now connected on both the, the, the 192 network, so things like the corporate network, and the 10 dot network, so the OT network. So again, that device had always had been bridging for many months between both networks and was actually unplugged a couple of days before we came to do our audit. Uh, we also find undocumented modems um, where a provider of some OT kit has fitted a modem and not told the, told the ship owner about it. That is not uncommon. Um, and quite often we find those with default uh, usernames and passwords. Uh, on the rig, as an example, we found a, um, a Wi-Fi access point um, called Oily Zone that shouldn't have been there. Um, again, uh, that gave access directly into the operational network, and it had a really poor password, um, which was the name of the um, uh, one of the contractors that had been previously working on that vessel. Um, so again, um, undocumented devices we find on vessels very frequently, uh, particularly the older the vessel has been uh, since it had a refit. Uh, this one was really interesting. This was a, a, a relatively new vessel. Uh, it was a shipping container. Uh, many of you will recognize this as the, as the bridging system. And uh, for the first few days, we didn't actually notice um, the display that the arrow is pointing at. Um, but we just assumed it was a clipboard. Um, but then uh, one of my colleagues uh, realized actually it's the same as the monitor at the other end. So on some further investigation, um, we discovered it was connected to uh, a device called Blue Tracker and it was sending uh, Modbus serial data uh, to and from a device. So one of my colleagues, Andrew, uh, traced this down and um, we discovered um, uh, two things which were really quite alarming. Um, this was a device that had been used to monitor um, uh, the, engine, the engine system. Um, the, it had been uh, end of life, um, so it wasn't being used anymore, but it was still uh, connected and commissioned. Um, and the monitor on the bridge that's covered up with paperwork because they couldn't physically turn it off was running a version of TeamViewer. That was out of date, uh, running a very poor password and exploitable. So anybody could have accessed that device. The reason that's really quite scary is the blue tracker was used for monitoring vapor as it builds up in, in the, the crank cover um, of the engine. So that's what the crankshaft looks like. Uh, the crank cover is about as tall as, tall as an average two-storey building and uh, if vapours build up on those and they explode they uh, can go catastrophically wrong. So it would be possible to, um, to manipulate that data and ultimately stop the engine um, by giving it the wrong data. So uh, um, a denial of service attack effectively on that vessel um, over the public internet um, via TeamViewer. So let's talk about crashing vessels and things. So um, some of the things we can do to bridge systems. Um, uh, this is some research that we did last year. We went down to a, an ECDIS vendor, so electronic chart display and information systems, um, to one of the resellers uh, in the UK that gave us access to uh, I think it was eight different ECDISCs and um, uh, WECDISCs. Um, and many of them were running on NT and XP. Um, the reason for that is typically they have been historically airspaced and it takes a lot of money and time to certify these things. Um, so uh, many of them are running on, on very old operating systems. Uh, that gave us a, a number of things to play with. 
Um, so this is the, the on the right hand side is the popular egg disc. Um, the one on the uh, on the on the uh, other side of the screen uh, is a warship version, so used by a number of navies in Europe. And we found SQL injection, so we thought it might be entertaining to to in inject some code into these. Uh, this video will run twice. So it'll run properly at the same time. So yes, we decided to recroll it, which is uh, something we do for entertainment value. Certainly something that somebody a, a, a threat app that wants to entertain uh, might do. <laughs> so that was injecting uh, Rick Ashley uh, into an egg disk. Um, this is uh, quite interesting. So this was also uh, an egg disk and we had the ability to um, uh, manipulate the data. There's actually a couple of attacks here and I'll touch on another one shortly where we could move the GPS antenna. Uh, but again, um, this video will show, uh, this is Dover Harbour. And again, it will run twice. There we are. And that's uh, moving a vessel from inside to outside the harbour wall in Dover Harbour. Um, so uh, by code injection. So it's possible to move a vehicle, uh, move a vessel um, by uh, by injecting code into the edges. Uh, and as these systems start to become more connected, um, the, uh, the, the, the threat angle um, ceases to simply be via uh, malicious code on USB. Uh, and starting on, uh, on, on through uh, connected systems. Um, let me bounce past that one again. Let's not play that again. Um, and the other thing we're also able to do is actually move the position of the antenna. Um, so another interesting attack. So rather than uh, manipulate with the data for in the egg disk itself, is to manipulate the serial data and say the offset of the antenna is somewhere else. So if you move the the antenna from the bow to five meter, 500 meters further away, suddenly the vessel has moved, uh, which is uh, this method number two. So uh, again, um, some other things that you can do by looking at serial data, so Modbus 485, et cetera, um, is manipulating um, the information going from a sensor back to the systems. Um, there's no authentic checking on, on serial data. Um, and there's no authentication checking on the, on the, mo on the protocols themselves. Um, so if you're able to uh, access the serial of a device or a system, you can cause an awful lot of uh, mayhem. Um, so enemy, enemy uh, 0183, uh, as an example, um, is used to show positioning. Um, that's a plain text protocol and it's possible to, to move it. Um, so effectively the hack would be um, to, to come in via the, uh, the SATCOM uh, into the switch, find the, the serial to ethernet converters and sit in that environment somewhere and then manipulate the data between the two systems. So we've demonstrated that these types of attacks moving the GPS antenna can be done remotely and is far easier to do than trying to, try to jam or spoof GPS. Um, and again, autopilots, um, this is a, a signaling for uh, an autopilot um, and again, by manipulating the serial data, it would be possible to change um, left to right, manipulate the, the checksum. And although um, things like a, a, a container ship, um, they, they, uh, they stop fairly slowly, they turn remarkably quickly. Um, and to get one going the wrong way across a shipping lane uh, could be quite an interesting attack. Uh, likewise, perhaps manipulating ballast um, and uh, trying to, uh, to roll one over. So one of the other interesting things we did on the on the um, uh, on the drilling rig was compromise the um, uh, the Siemens switches. So this is a scale art switch. Uh, it's a very common industrial switch or process logic controller. Uh, it's used in all sorts of industrial systems for uh, moving cranes up and down, robots left and right, all sorts of things. Um, and we end, ended up identifying a high a criticality that affected effectively every seam and switch. Um, a really interesting way of, of looking at a red team on a vessel. Um, so the, the switches themselves had um, a known vulnerability, which allowed, which meant if you had access to the serial port or the conf port, uh, you could extract um, the config file. What one of my colleagues noticed was there were two hashed versions of the admin password. So immediately we scratch our head and say, why would you have two versions of an administration password? So at this point, we had access to the firmware, which we downloaded, but we didn't have access to a physical switch that we could tamper with. 
Um, what, what my colleague uh, Chris Wade noticed was also, as you change the password, the password hash changed length as well, which suggested to us that the, um, the, uh, the, the uh, encryption use was probably reversible. So we decided to extend some time uh, understanding if we could compromise these switches. Um, so looking at the firmware, um, for those of you that understand um, uh, operating code, um, that the, the E numbers there indicated it was an ARM processor. Um, so Chris Way, one of our uh, ARM reverse engineer specialists, um, uh, took the firmware and loaded it into a tool called IDA as a little India file. Um, and what IDA tries to do is then decompile it back into its constituent parts. Fortunately, um, it had been uh, um, the operating system they were using on the switch turned out to be VXWorks. Um, so that gave us some, some more clues and uh, we were then able to uh, stitch together um, a large degree of the, of the, uh, of the operating system. Um, working through there, uh, we identified a, a click edit password file. Um, so that started to give indications that the encryption was either probably Blowfish or Triple Des. Um, and uh, with some further work, um, we then managed to identify the exact Blowfish library that had been used to create those encryption keys. So we're, we're part way there at that point. Um, what we th we're then able to do, we bought on eBay a, a scale on switch on eBay um, and connected to the hardware. Um, and then we were then able to do a, a couple of things um, and identify effectively the entry points of the operating system. So which parts of the operating system were doing what. Um, ultimately, that led us to identify um, the keys they were using. And this particular device um, had uh, was using two keys. There was a second key that was used to encrypt the admin key, um, uh, ELS debug. Uh, but what we discovered that that, that uh, second uh, encryption form of encryption was the same on every Siemens switch. So what we then discovered was ultimately, um, uh, once you knew that key, if you could get the config file from one of those PLCs, um, you could um, own that switch. And in fact, every Siemens switch you get hold of. So the attack we ultimately did on the uh, on the um, the drilling rig was we compromised its SATCOM. Um, we migrated into the network. We also found the config files for the routers and the switches. Uh, we then demonstrated that we could remove the config file and all the PLCs. We could then deconfigure all of the routes, all of the switches on the way out. Uh, and the routers, and then reconfigure the firewall. So although the crew could hit the blowout protector, um, they wouldn't be able to um, uh, uh, restart the vessel in any way without flying an IT crew out there. So quite a, a comprehensive um, thing. I have to say, uh, hats off to Siemens, who were uh, extremely responsive um, in the way that they dealt with that problem. Um, so if anybody from Siemens um, are listening, uh, well done people. So other connected things in ports, more and more were things getting connected to the internet. So we mentioned Showdown earlier on, um, and be, uh, um, uh, uh, on the vessel itself or port side, we're seeing more and more things connected. Here are a couple of examples. Um, the white uh, box there is, a, is another uh, industrial switch used for uh, opening and closing barriers or doors or such like. Um, there are many of these on the public internet, um, and many of them still have default passwords. The one on the right is, is really interesting. It's used for um, cleaning and managing air conditioning systems. So to prevent people getting um, Legionnaire's disease. Um, again, many of these default passwords are visible on the public internet. Um, so you can effectively start um, uh, manipulating uh, air conditioning systems in building, potentially uh, giving the risk of Legionnaire's disease. Um, and that's just two examples. Another, a, a really bizarre one. Um, this is in Korea somewhere. We're not quite sure what it is. Um, but again, it's a, a system you can uh, unauthenticated log straight in. You can start filling tanks, emptying tanks. We think it's some sort of dairy, but we're not quite sure why you want to uh, milk a baby cow. Um, but uh, again, many systems, and we, and we found these in universities, um, in uh, military bases, um, all sorts of different devices that are available. So it's worth understanding what you have from a, a, a building management um, perspective that might be IT enabled. Uh, that is either directly connected to your vessel or uh, potentially um, uh, your your crew sites or your shore side systems. Um, and also something to understand with um, with when attacking a ship, if a, if a hardened threat actor wants to, they can buy some of the equipment you have. So um, this is a SATCOM. Um, we bought one of these and uh, started to look at it. Um, some of the things that we find 
um, as we glitch them extracts in the firmware, uh, doing chip offs, uh, quite often we will find undocumented services. So Telnet um, and SSH um, embedded uh, um, usernames and passwords um, in certain scenarios. Um, and people that write the code for these devices don't typically realize that people like us or a threat actor can start extracting, glitching it, taking up the, the firmware and reverse engineering them. Um, that's clearly demonstrated by this. This was in a SATCOM and the code was written, Chuck Knollis kills you. So clearly didn't expect anybody to be looking at, uh, at the code they've written. Um, I thought I'd touch on, um, before we finish, sort of cloud and, and, and API services, because we're seeing in more and more scenarios, connected systems. So we know through current circumstances and driving into the future, um, uh, cost of transport and maritime has always been a very low margin business and quite a high cost business. And any ways there are to extract information from the vessel um, to make it more efficient, um, are, there are lots of drivers to do. And if you can re reduce the operating cost by maybe a percent or so, uh, that has a significant impact on a, on a fleet. So we're seeing more and more systems being connected. Um, we've started to see things like bridging systems, uh, bridge control systems, that traditionally have always been completely air-spaced and relied and simply relied on physical security, i.e. Uh, the cases that they're locked in as their security, and now starting to offer cloud services with mobile applications, web applications, and feeding data back into a central point, be that the service provider's cloud or um, a corporate cloud. Um, and that uh, form of connectivity is starting to give an additional entry point um, and there are vulnerabilities in cloud service and APIs um, that some people are not clearly aware of. So I thought it's important to touch on that today as it's uh, potentially affecting the way that we can interact with and potentially compromise a vessel uh, going forward. Um, so I'm going to touch on actually some automotive examples. Um, the ones that I have in Maritime are currently under um, disclosure. So I thought these ones are the public domain. The concepts are the same. So we understand as things have moved from on-premises to as a service and software as a service and many cloud-based services. And a lot of services communicate by what's called an API. So uh, an API is an application program interface. Um, and is a way that two systems talk and send information to each other. Um, the way if you're using a, a mobile application, uh, when you press a button on your on your mobile app, um, that is sending a, an API request to a back end server um, that's doing things like posting your comments uh, or liking something on Facebook or requesting to change your password. Um, APIs have two concepts, authentication and authorization. So authentication is typically um, is Nigel Hearn who he says he is? And then authorization is thereafter is, am I allowed to make this request? And we quite often find it's within the authorization of an API where we find the failures. So I'm just gonna to touch on a, the unhackable car alarm. Uh, one of my colleagues bought um, a Pandora car alarm and they, a wonderful website that claims that they were, um, you know, using multiple encryption, um, never, never breached, um, uh, all, all these great claims. So to say you're unhackable is, is red rag to a, to a set of pen testers. So we thought we'd take a look at this um, and some interesting things. So the functionality on the mobile application was um, you could uh, uh, identify and geolocate your vehicle. You could lock it and unlock it using the mobile application. You could start it and stop it. So start it on, on a winter or summer's day. So it heats up or cools down, depending where you are in the world. And you could also activate the panic alarm or open the boot. At least that's how it was supposed to work. So the authentication was implemented really quite well, but the authorization was either thoroughly missing or partially missing. So we registered a number of accounts and we identified to start with that if you simply changed your user ID, um, you could then start uh, looking at other um, IDs for other user accounts. Um, and ultimately we were able to enumerate all of their accounts. Um, we also identified that um, this is the, the actually the API call itself, which we'd, we've proxied between the phone um, and, the, uh, and, the, and the server. Um, and then we're there, uh, therefore able to start changing the email. So what I could do on somebody else's user account um, is simply change their email address to my email address and then instigate a password reset. 
and that password reset then came to my email address and therefore I now own that account. Um, we, we found a, a number of, um, uh, it's called an indirect uh, object reference. Um, this affected about 2 million vehicles worldwide. So, um, and we could do various other things uh, within that account once you owned it. So um, uh, managed to um, uh, compromise about 2 million vehicles. Um, a fairly easy thing for them to fix uh, once they knew about it. Um, another good example would be Viper, again, a smart car alarm. Um, this one was actually slightly easier because we didn't have to do a password reset. We could simply change the email address within the API. Um, so had this been some sort of maritime system, uh, we could then take control of that account and start extracting the, vessel, the, the, vehicle, the information about the vessel and potentially um, start uh, um, compromising the data or sending uh, messages back to the vessel. Um, so the, the modify user requests were not verified at all on this, this particular mobile application. Um, Tracker was also similar, again, um, full or idle compromise. Um, Tracker um, are known in Europe. Um, uh, they're um, also uh, um, under a different brand in the US, can't quite remember their name currently. Um, and the idea with a tracker is fitted to your, to your vehicle. Um, it knows that you've parked, and then um, if somebody moves your vehicle um, and it moves from its location, its geofence moves, it uh, notifies an alarm center. Um, the alarm center contact you and say, have you moved your vehicle? No, I haven't. The police are contacted and then using the, uh, the GPS coordinates, the police would go and recover your vehicle. And in the UK, they have something like a 97% recovery rate. So it's very effective. At least that, again, that's how it should work. Um, Again, uh, we were able to trigger um, a forgot password request and we could change the user's password um, uh, email address to ours and take control of that account. Um, we could also delete things from certain accounts. So we were, would be able to um, turn off the geofencing. Um, we could also delete, delete um, alerts. So we could say on my account, I don't want to be alerted if my vehicle moves. Um, and we could also geolocate all the vehicles, so we could decide uh, which which of the um, the BMW 7 Series locally we wanted to steal. Um, so uh, quite an interesting uh, attack, um, and really hopefully demonstrates the need for um, comprehensive API testing. When people have a web application, be that one that's been written for your organization or you're using a third party supplier, um, once you, if you're having yours scoped or you're asking them for a copy of their pen testing reports, ensure that if there are APIs, they've had a full and comprehensive API web application a test done because we are find very commonly failures in these. Um, I think people are getting better and better at securing web applications and cloud-based applications, but the APIs have certainly been overlooked. So I guess that's um, in sort of 40 minutes, uh, an overview of the most common things that we're seeing um, in the last 12 months in Maritime. Um, there are a, a number of things um, that are similar, but in more detail that I was hoping to be able to disclose today, but we haven't got quite through that disclosure process. Um, so do keep an eye on our blog um, where there's a lot of information. Um, we're quite unusual as an organization where we give our, our, our guys and girls about 20% of the working day to do research in R&D. So um, all of the information on our blog is in the public domain um, and any uh, private research that we do, unless we're able to discuss some of it as we are with, uh, uh, with the drilling rig, um, that remains confidential. Um, there's a lot of information posted uh, on our Twitter feed uh, for those of you who do Twitter. Um, if anybody would like to connect with me and got any questions after the Q&A of this session, uh, the easiest way to find me is just to put cybersafe.org into your browser and that will drop onto my LinkedIn uh, profile. Please uh, feel free to connect with me. Uh, all my email address is there at the bottom and um, uh, more than happy to answer any questions about the sort of work we do or um, you know, recommendations. If you're looking at some testing, um, be that, you know, potentially via us or, or somebody else, if you'd like some view on, on what you should potentially be looking at and uh, where, uh, particularly as people have limited budgets within the maritime space, where that money might be best spelt, spent, um, do, do reach out more than happy to have a conversation. Wonderful. Thank you, Nigel, very much. That was, that was fascinating. What we have here now is a, a number of questions that have come up um, on, on the Slido. 
site. So I'm going to ask you those. Um, we'll get through as many as we can in the time that we, that we have. Um, so I'll just start pitching them to you and you'll start answering. Um, the first one up here is, are most, are most of these hacks being conducted on board vessels or is there potential to perform remotely? So to answer that, um, uh, on the OT systems, um, you would need to be quite a sophisticated threat actor to compromise OT remotely. Um, having said that, there, there are people capable of it. Um, certainly we as individuals are, so I wouldn't rule it out. Um, uh, there are certainly on things like um, cruise liners, we found um, junction boxes where we can get into internet connections and fiber connections, which are in public areas of a vessel. Um, so if you have the white right cabin on a particular cruise vessel, you can compromise all sorts of things being, a, a being on board. Um, SATCOM, I think the golden rule with SATCOM is um, ensure that your IP, your, your provider is natting your IP address behind uh, on a private IP address so it doesn't appear on the public internet. Um, phishing is still a big problem, uh, but we're seeing more and more the ability to bridge between the cruise network or the operational network on a vessel into OT. So OT is certainly far harder. Um, the insider threat, the onboard threat, um, the malicious user is certainly a higher one. Um, and uh, there are different ways of managing that risk, but it's certainly what we've demonstrated on the, the drilling rig, for example, we could have compromised every, or we did demonstrate we can compromise the entire global fleet and the corporate HQ uh, in time at the moment. Great, thank you. Um, you mentioned lots of ships, navies using old operating systems. Are there measures to defend against this or is upgrading the OS the only way? So upgrading the OS is sometimes not possible because if, if your chosen XDIS vendor um, only provides it on XP, it's the only thing you can run it on. Um, the, the important things are to ensure it is properly airspaced. Um, and if, um, if it's a method of update is by USB, you have a good policy um, on what USBs go into it and you're managing that change control effectively. Um, so you have risk management controls around it. There are always situations where you have to have systems running an old OS. Um, just make sure it's, uh, it's nowhere near the, it's, it's not connected to the, um, the network. If it is, you've got appropriate controls around it. Um, it's a risk we have to carry. Um, but again, with a, with a, with a land based system, you know, appropriate controls and, and uh, push your vendor to upgrade as soon as they can. Although with FDIS, it's an expensive thing to do. So many are still operational next week. All right. With more automation of ships, systems, and potentially UAVs in the future, what risk do you see in the, uh, in the hacking of these systems and subsequent liability? So the, the, a number of things with, with automation typically goes into a cloud. Um, so whether you're using uh, G Cloud, Google Cloud, AWS, or, or Zero, or something similar, um, we find they are uh, those organisations are very good at managing security if it's configured correctly. Um, it's well worth ensuring you have some specialists going through your configuration, and then, well, excuse me, once you have a configuration you're happy with, then using a script to spin up any additional containers. Um, quite often, we find within. Um, those applications, um, particularly where you have um, uh, continuous development and integration, the various modules talking to each other and sometimes the way they communicate, um, the keys are not always as secure as you'd like them to be. Um, so uh, a, a, a very solid and robust security view against the cloud um, configuration itself. Um, the web and mobile applications ensure that they are tested the API specifically um, and the things around the parameter. Um, it is an inevitability that we're moving more and more to the clouds to get data in and off. So be that autonomous um, um, shipping um, or semi-autonomous shipping, not sure we're really gonna get to fully autonomous um, and also for UAVs. So uh, the, 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 the implications really for both are the same. Um, you know, anything that is publicly facing um, and it is therefore onwardly connected into the vessel um, it needs some very, very stringent um, and very well managed auditing uh, and penetration testing managers to make sure that the code you're using is secure. Um, and don't rely on, you know, once every couple of years. Um, if it's a critical system connected to a critical system, then it's worth looking at what major changes need, even potentially minor changes. All right. What are the main reasons for hacking a ship? Um, 
that's a good question um, because you know the motivation isn't entirely clear. So so let's think about malicious. Let's think of nation state and let's think of organised crime. So why would a nation state want to hack a ship? Well, if you could hack a ship and roll it over in in the when it's coming into the port of Dover or Antwerp or somewhere, um, you know you could block a shipping channel or a, a port for quite a quite considerable amount of time. Um, so if we, if we could compromise it, if we could like, affect the balance and it rolls over, like, how long is it going to take to remove that ship? That's probably a nation state attack. Um, is it likely to happen? Well, I think we all pretty much understand the next world war will be cyber and it won't be so much guns. Um, so that might be an effective way to try and compromise um, a, a nation. Um, if I was an organised crime organisation and I wanted to extort the cruise liner, if I was again able to uh, uh, attack the ballast and I could make a cruise liner start rocking from side to side in the Caribbean Sea, um, how quickly do I think that organisation would pay me $10 million to stop and then come after me afterwards? Um, so I think there are different motivations. I think the other motivation is people doing stuff by accident. Um, you know, people have found the system on the internet. They don't know what it was. They found it by showdown. Um, you know, they've got into a system, they don't know what it is, you know, and if that could be, um, you know, the, um, uh, the blue tracker system connected to that, to, to that camshaft, then that's a whole world of pain. So there are different motivations. Um, I think uh, once upon a time, maybe five years ago, we thought, why would you attack a ship? Yeah, why? I think now there are lots of reasons why people might do. Okay. Well, uh, you mentioned, oh, oh, sorry, you mentioned a lot more items been connected on board ships this will continue to grow but do do you recommend centralizing control of these systems or decentralizing um it's what's appropriate to your your organization we've, we've seen some organizations that are trying to manage everything from from hq um i think um uh, it really just depends on the maturity of your organization some organizations have the ability to build uh, a, a security operation center um, and with increased bandwidth coming from a vessel, we start to see more data coming off. Um, and the more data I have, the, more, the easier it is to manage it centrally. We also see a number of vendors selling hardware appliances that will go on your vessel and will do all these jobs for you. Um, one of them that will remain nameless and um, comes in a default any, any rule. So if you install it, a, install it a default, it won't protect you against anything. And when we questioned that with the vendor, they said, oh, well, that's the way our customers like to have it installed. Um, so it's doing no anti-malware. It's got doing no um, um, web application file, firewalling. It's just, a, it's just a, a dumb device that sits there. Um, some things you can do, do on board. Um, one of the challenges you have is getting alerting off. Um, so the, 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 the less amount of remote access you can have, and um, the strong passwords internally, so people can't compromise the systems, the better. Um, it, it really is, um, you know, security best practice 101 from what we were probably doing 10 years ago and start applying that to your vessel. Do you think this all exposes the danger of ships being autonomous? Um, you would like to think if a ship becomes completely autonomous, then it is actually, depending how it's managed, it's, it's centrally managed from a central point. Um, you, have a, you would like to think there would be a, a very strong VPN between the control center and it, and therefore you're, you're protecting the control center. Um, are ships gonna become completely autonomous? Well, is a ship ever gonna wake up in the morning and go, well, I think I, think I might go to, to Southampton for the day, probably not. Um, it really just depends, I think, on, on, on your view between autonomous and highly automated. Um, but again, I think that moves back into um, security 101, as in clear segregation within within systems on board, um, be that by by VLANs, VLANs and firewalling, and knowing you have separate systems for um, for the critical systems, ensuring you have the appropriate monitoring in place, um, and then you have redundant systems to get to it. Um, and you're, you're you know the, the more you connect to the internet, the more risk you have. We, knew, we all know if, if it's safe today, it may not be safe tomorrow. So, you know, there's, 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 no, there's no easy answer for that. But if you're, um, it, it's, it's a lot easier to design a brand new vessel today and make it quite secure. It's quite difficult to have an old, old vessel and make it completely secure because of the legacy. So, 
I think um, you know it, it's from the it's from the designer. But um, you know, when we when we go on our first autonomous vessel, um, we wouldn't expect it to be risk free. But that's what you do all it's for. Okay. How good is physical security on these ships? What measures are implemented? Can be really good, can be really bad. Um, I've walked into a port um, in Spain and onto a vessel completely unchallenged. <laughs> um, I've been on a cruise ship where the door entry card was on the outside of the door, as was the door handle to open it. And there was no door handle on the inside to get out. So they clearly hung the door the wrong way around. Um, so to get into that comms room was as simple as opening the door. You didn't need a door entry card. Um, We've been on vessels where, um, you know, in, in one of one of my team's cabins, we found trunking with fibre on, um, with a switch in it, and we plugged into the switch and we've had access to CCTV, we've had access to um, uh, to the onboard telephone system, etc. Um, so again, sometimes it's really good, um, sometimes it's really poor. Um, it really just depends on, on the vessel. And quite often, once you get access to a system, um, you know, that might be a, a, a PC in a cupboard, it might be a bridging system or, or something. Um, you know, USB uh, sockets will be exposed. There's quite often no device control on it. Um, you know, you, you have a way in. Quite often it's, it's trivial to guess the password. Um, so physical security, again, it depends on the vessel. Do you, do you recommend crew monitoring of these systems, similar to machinery watches? Um, Again, it depends on, on how, you, how you justify the increase in crew, because the, the, the justification is always to go down rather than up. Um, IMO is going to make things more important because cybersecurity becomes part of maritime safety effectively. And if you fail cybersecurity, you fail safety and therefore you become deflagged. So there is a very significant driver for it. Um, uh, on some vessels that are having a, a lot more um, uh, interaction uh, by the cloud, we are seeing some people with a responsibility on as part of the crew um, to monitor certain systems and they're having a driver where um, they're starting to look at taking more log file information uh, in a strategic way off the vessel or um, in some cases they're centrally correlating log files on the vessel and then they're using that as a point of monitoring off the vessel itself so there, there are a number of ways to look at it um, probably the, the centralised logging on board a vessel and then monitoring that remotely is probably the one that's easier to do um, uh, in, in, the, in the short term. Hmm. Is rogue program insertion possible using radio methods? If so, how easy would it be to filter rogueware at the receiver followed by firmware firewall? It's a really, really tough thing to do. I think we're getting at, we're getting at sort of nation state type attacks at that point. Um, it wouldn't be the thing I'm most concerned about. Um, certainly from an RF perspective, there are various things that, 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 that you can do as in um, start spoofing AIS, um, jamming AIS, um, all sorts of things, pretending you're something you're not. Um, that is probably a, an easier RF attack. Um, things like GPS and spoofing is a really, really hard thing to do. Um, that's a really hard attack. I think we've seen it a, a number of times, uh, probably by the Chinese, to make a number of uh, US military vessels um, run the ground and crash into things. Um, uh, you know, the first time was an accident. It happened four times, so maybe, maybe that was nation state. Um, it's very hard to tell, and nobody's ever quite sure. Um, I wouldn't be, um, I wouldn't be too concerned about some of my RF kit except where it's getting over the air updates. Um, so uh, be that RF, whether we're talking, you know, HF, VHF, Wi-Fi, if it is taking over the air updates, um, then depending on how they're checked, what sort of checksums you have, um, it may be possible to, to interfere with those. But again, it's quite a specialist attack. How would you train seafarers of your findings? So we do we do a, a, a number of bits of um, of, of training. Um, one of my colleagues, Ken, co collaborated on quite an interesting book. Um, so it, really, training is for seafarers is really about the basics: um, passwords, passwords, and passwords. Um, talking about physical security around USB and device control, um, making them understand the risks of uh, phishing attacks and the use of social media. 
Um, so um, you know, a number of attacks where we've done event streaming, we've identified individuals, we've fished them, they've clicked on a link, we've bypassed AV. Um, in one case, we had directly access to the um, what you would define as the effectively the business system, so the crew network. Uh, in one other scenario, we had access to the crew's dirty network. Um, they had a video system that they could install and play their own videos on. Um, we were able to compromise that and use that to bridge back into the crew system and then from the crew systems to compromise the vessel. Um, so training for crew um, from an IT security perspective, I wouldn't treat it really much differently to what I do with um, uh, with a general user, other than you've got additional things around specifically you're talking about this, you're talking about um, SATCOMs, um, but the normal things around device control, password management, uh, understanding who you're letting have access to your systems, um, not clicking on links you don't understand, not opening files you're not expecting. Uh, it really is the basics would, would, would be a really good start. Can you block mobile signals on the bridge to prevent use during navigation? Of course, without interfering with the navigation systems. Uh, yeah, you could. You could, um, uh, in theory, yeah. If, if the um, you can you can block almost any type of RF um, and frequency specifically if you wanted to. Okay. If the regulations you mentioned have been implemented on your example projects, would it still have been possible to hack those systems? Um. It's always, it's, it would always be possible to hack OT if you can get physical access to it, um, because the protocols that run across the, the serial networks are unencrypted, unauthenticated, and if you can interfere with them, you can interfere with the ship. Um, the key thing is if you look at the external entry points, so Wi-Fi, um, authorised and unauthorised um, third-party uh, modems, uh, be that things like TeamView or, 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 or Wi-Fi access points, um, the SATCOM itself. If you're securing all of those things and you, uh, you have um, uh, adequate training itself so they're not clicking on links and, and doing phishing, then you've, as with the corporate environment, you've, you've closed the majority of the doors. Um, and then somebody's got to wait for a, a vulnerability that isn't um, patched against yet and look to exploit that if they can. Um, the, um, uh, the inside of threat or the physical threat is, is it's always going to be the, the biggest one on maritime. Um, Having said that, as we've already said, we're marching towards the cloud. And once you have cloud access, then you have remote access. So you're giving potentially um, lots of other systems that may at some point have a vulnerability that could get exploited. Hmm. What is your opinion about password managers for both personal and business use? I use a password manager for everything. I use, personally, I use a, a soft piece of software tool called LastPass. It's free for one user user. I've got all my family using it. Um, I, I only know two passwords. One is my BitLocker, no, I don't know three. My BitLocker password for my corporate laptop. I know my domain password and I know my uh, last pass password. Um, everything else, be it Facebook, be it my gas bill, be it my once a year insurance premium, I just go into LastPass and manage it for me. I have it on my mobile phone, I have it on my laptop. Um, and we use KeyPass from a corporate perspective uh, because I, we, we like to have our passwords secured internally. Uh, LastPass were hacked once a few years ago. The moment they were, they reset everybody's passwords. They told everybody they were very upfront about it. Um, you've got to trust somebody, and I, I choose to trust LastPass. Hmm. Can systems sharing the same cloud be assured separation to protect them from cross-system interference by another party? Yep. So part of part of cloud testing, a very important part is uh, is lateral movement. So is to ensure well, lateral and vertical movement. So to ensure that I can't become my manager, um, I can't become my colleague, and then very importantly to ensure that uh, organization one cannot get into organization two. That's managed in different ways by different um, uh, service providers. Um, but if it's tested properly and it's managed properly, um, then that shouldn't be a concern. Um, as an example, many organizations, uh, including ourselves, use Salesforce, um, you know, and that contains my client data as well as lots of other people. So if it's tested and secured properly, it wouldn't be a concern to me. I'm just going to do one last question here. Have you done any cybersecurity drills with shipping companies like Shipshore drills? Uh, depend, not quite sure what they mean by Shipshore drills, but we've done um, simulated cyber attacks um, on a vessel. Um, yeah, along with a, a partner, and we've also done the same thing. So tabletop exercises 
um, uh, on land um, with uh, um, the operational people on, on board. So, so yes, if that's something you're interested in, um, we either do it ourselves or we also do some uh, with a partner that's, um, that also works with GCHQ and the Royal Navy. So um, there are lots of ways to do that. From a, um, a consulting perspective, we do a lot of work around disaster recovery um, and sort of policy management, and that really sort of falls into our, our consultancy team. So we can look at um, incident response training, uh, incident response management, and then look at the incident response policies and then build a test scenario around that. So um, we, we have done it. It's not all that common, um, but if, if it, you're at that place in your maturity cycle, it's a really worthwhile thing to do. Okay. Actually, I'm going to pop. We literally have one question left. <laughs> so if we can answer it quickly, I know we're just on time here. Yeah. And then we'll wrap up. Is it, is, is it not the role of the system architect to ensure provenance and validation uh, within the system and by uh, use of modern data tools like BIST might do this? Um, yes, of, of course. Um, security should be um, designed in and built in at the very beginning, um, but then it needs to be audited. I mean, what we do find is yeah, these days, some people say, well, how do I do this? They'll copy and paste a piece of code from somewhere and we find that uh, same poorly piece, written piece of code popping up again and again. Um, but uh, security by design, absolutely. And the best projects we work on are when we're involved at the architecture stage um, on recommendations and then sort of testing it towards the end. Um, misconfigurations are possible and happen all the time. Um, you know, passwords get forgotten to be changed. Um, VLANs forget to be uh, configured correctly. Um, and um, systems get added that bridge um, maybe networks together or systems together that hadn't been thought about. So uh, absolutely, it's part of the design process, but um, you know, validation is very important to ensure it's doing what you expect it to do. Great. Well, we're one minute over. So I, <laughs> Nigel, thank you very, very much for your time answering the questions. Great insights. This is a key area. Um, and it's really an important topic. So thank you. All this information will be, of course, posted on, on online here. Um, and thank you, everyone, for attending today. Thanks, everybody. Super stuff. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Keep safe.